A gangster's daughter murdered gangland style just days before the Christmas holiday. And a cryptic note sent to the Beverly Hills Police Department with one word and an address leading to the discovery of Susan Berman's body. One shot, execution style, was all it took to take the life of the author journalist. It has something to do with her best friend and the disappearance of his wife nearly 19 years prior. Some point the finger right out of the gate to the millionaire Robert Durst and others are concerned about Susan's life that no one else seemed to know about. But one thinks back to December 19th, days before her murder, in a conversation she had with her best friend, Kim. Kim was packing for a cruise she had been eagerly looking forward to and on the phone with Susan. Susan was adamant that she knew something that was really going to, quote, blow the top off of things. Of course, anyone with a smidge of curiosity wanted to know what she knew, but because of her journalist background, Susan held and talked up the information she knew and how it could change things. Most of the stuff that Susan wrote covered were about the organized crime industry, but what she might have been hinting at was the information that she knew and who to talk to in order to get even more on the events that happened of January 31st, 1982. Another strange turn of events happened in the days leading up to Susan's death. When she was having her regular 15 minute conversation with her psychic who told her she was going to die a violent death and it would be with a gun. Robert wasn't going down for Kathy's murder. No matter who was chasing him and no matter who got in his way, no matter what, Kathy's murder would never be pinned on him. Welcome to the True Crime Librarian. I'm your librarian and host, Ashley. Tonight, we carry on with the bizarre case that is that of Robert Durst. Last week, we went through his first marriage with Kathy. She went missing on January 31st, 1982, and was never seen again. This year was the 40th anniversary of Kathy missing, and it occurred just last week. And today, we only know what they did in 1982. Speculation surrounding Kathy's disappearance and probable murder is that Robert lost his temper and killed Kathy. He then disposed of her body and Robert's best friend Susan Berman stepped up and helped cover up what Robert had done, throwing investigators off of their track and helping Robert get away with his very first murder. But what she didn't know is her friend would make headlines again, and this time it would be for her murder. Warning, this episode contains graphic detail of murder and adult language. Listener's discretion is advised. If you feel as though any of this could be too much for you, please skip this episode or have someone listen with you or for you. Good evening, my true crime nerds. We have very little to get to tonight. Just a reminder, Patreon is up and running and TTCL offers different tiers to meet the different needs of each of my nerds. 
you can still support the show with a one-time donation by heading over to the truecrimelibrarian.com and clicking that donate button. Don't forget to review and recommend the show. This is the best and easiest way to help out the show without a dime leaving your pocket. If you have, are listening through YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe so you never miss an upload. Those listening on your favorite podcast app, don't forget to sub so that you never miss an episode. Also, now to what you all came here for, the true crime. Like I said earlier in the welcoming, last week we took a look at Robert's early life and his marriage to Kathy prior to her disappearance. However, there were numerous counts of domestic assault happening against Kathy as their marriage began to deteriorate. And eventually she, she went missing. Tonight, I'm going to introduce you to the lady that helped him throw investigators off his trail and helped him get away with his very first murder. Let me introduce you all to Susan Jane Berman. Susan was born May 18, 1945, to Betty Ewald and David, or Davy Berman, and she was the only child to both people. Her mother was also known as Gladys Evans. She was a dancer, and that was her stage name. But her mother suffered from depression, and this would later come to play in Susan's life. Davy Berman, he was partner to organized crime leader Bugsy Siegel. And after Bugsy's death, Davy took over the Flamingo in Las Vegas. However, Davy would die of a heart attack while on the table getting a general procedure done. Susan was just 12 years old. Susan speculated that there's more to the story on her father's death than what she was told. But you can't prove all, all of the documentation from the hospital shows that it was a heart attack. Whether there was a medical-induced or medicine-induced heart attack or I don't know. She believes that her dad died under suspicious circumstances. Possibly. Losing a parent at this age is hard no matter what. But just a year after Davy's death, Susan was left all alone when Betty accidentally overdosed. Again, some speculate that there are some suspicious circumstances surrounding the overdose, but it has never been marked anything other than an accidental overdose. Whether or not somebody came in and provided her mom with enough drugs that it, you know, there was no other way than an overdose, or if she was given the shot of her, I, I don't know. I just know that when you look it up about her parents, Susan strongly believed both of them died under suspicious circumstances. And she was very in touch with that side of her. She was very in touch with the fact that her father was a, he was a gangster. I mean, there's no other way to prove it, to say it really, honestly. They participated in organized crime. Um, it would probably be, you know, some would say he was a mobster. Um, but if you're going to put it in the, the simplest form, he was a gangster. And when they asked him to jump, he said, how high? And he did it. Susan learned that her father was very loyal throughout his life. And this is something that would be passed down to Susan in her genetics and the way that she saw her father operate. It would play a huge role in her relationship with Robert Durst. In 1965, Susan met her best friend, Robert Allen Durst, when the two attended UCLA together. Robert had enrolled in doctoral school, and Susan was currently working on her degree for writing in English and language and stuff like that. The rumor, with her father being rumored to be such a loyal person, Susan took that and, and made it her. Now, this was probably... A way to make her feel more connected to her father but it may I mean a lot of it is if you think you can do it you're gonna do it uh, one of the biggest things I harp on is if you believe that a medication or an operation or um, whatever happens if you believe that is going to help you in the long run 
the more successful it will be at helping you in the long run. A lot of this is a mental acceptance and a mental fortitude to do what you want it to do. If you feel like it's not going to work, it's not going to work. You're going to find all of the negative things coming from whatever it was only to show that that didn't work. So, but with, with Susan and, and believing that her father was such a loyal person and he really was, if you go back and kind of look into his crime life, he really was a loyal person to those in his organization. So for Kathy to drop what she was doing and help Robert in 1982 when the media got wind that his wife had been reported missing from their Manhattan apartment, Susan was more than happy to stand by him. Whether she knew all of the details as to what happened that night, I don't know. Some of what I've read about Susan makes me believe that she knew just enough that if the police knocked on Robert's door, it was not going to be a good thing. Okay. I'm not sure if she was privy to a lot of the details of what occurred that night. And I think that's where that whole, I, I know something that will blow the lid off of everything. I think that's where that statement comes from. She knows that Robert is responsible and if she said what she knew, the, the course of that whole case could change. But she needed to be able to prove certain things she was speculating. But she did that of her own accord. I mean, when he called and he said, Kathy's missing and I need you to help me this, do this, this, and this, she did it. She told investigators lies that Kathy was a drug, a habitual drug user. And that she was promiscuous. So it was able to be like, okay, so we have a large suspect pool now, right? In reality, the only suspect they really need to be looking at is the guy that was her husband. But it, Susan, she, she knew what she was doing. She knew how to handle the media. She was part of the media. So... It, there was no question on whether or not she was going to help Robert. And once Robert and Seymour lawyered up and they didn't, the police didn't have a body to say it was murder. They didn't have a weapon to say that there was foul play. The investigation into Kathy's disappearance fizzled out and it found its home located in a binder that was up on the shelf with the other cold cases. And Susan and Robert kind of went on with their own life. In June of 1984, she was marrying her fiancé, Christopher, Mr. Margulies, and the two wed at the Hotel Bel Air. Guess who walked her down the aisle? That's right, Robert. He was there to give away his best friend. Little is really known about Sus Susan and Mr.'s relationship and their marriage because at some point shortly after they got married, he started using heroin. And Susan struggled with it. She struggled with his addiction. He, she struggled with his exuberant spending habit on that addiction. It was just a nightmare. Unfortunately, that nightmare would end in 1986 when Mr. died of an accidental heroin overdose. But the rumor mill says the marriage between him and Susan was basically over. She was tired of dealing with his addiction. She was tired of dealing with his his spending, she was just done with it all. In 1987, Susan's life took another turn when she began dating Paul Kaufman. And Paul came with two children and Susan was more than happy to take them on and they became a family. And this is the man that you are going to see most of her photographs with. If you see her photograph with anybody outside of Robert, I it's probably called Paul. They were together. She adored him. She loved him. He adored her. He loved her. They had his children and they were nothing but a big, happy, blended family. In 1988, as Susan's, you know, entering into this long-term relationship, Robert, he has a life-changing moment as well when a mutual friend of his introduced him to 
Deborah Shatteron, uh, I, they were both attending a dinner for a real estate association thing kind of thing. And Deborah and Robert hit it off really well. The relationship stayed uh, off the radar, though. Robert was Robert learned when his with his relationship with Kathy, he didn't like being put in the spotlight. It didn't matter who he was dating, didn't matter who he was married to. He wanted to live a very quiet life. And Kathy seemed to bring him to the front of the attention line, you know, and he didn't like that. And when I actually first met or not met uh, seen and, and heard from Deborah. It was during HBO's coverage called The Jinx of Robert Durst. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend you go out and watch that. There is so much going on from you, you see all of this being filmed, but what's going on in the background? Well, Robert's life is falling apart. But you hear from Deborah then, and it's interesting because she is very off-putting she you know it when she's asked a question about Robert she's like well I don't know you know him better than I do well really not because nobody knows him as well as Deborah does and Susan did I'll get on with this and you'll understand what I'm kind of talking about here Deborah and Robert they begin dating but unlike Kathy Deborah had grown up with a little bit more money than she had so the two were very kindred spirits and very drawn to one another. As life moved on for most, almost everyone, Kathy's family, they're still fighting for some answers to figure out what happened. They don't understand why Robert won't cooperate with the police. You know, since he's not cooperating, does that mean he is um, a suspect? Yes, very much. You know, y'all witnessed something prior to her death at the Christmas prior, they saw that Robert reached up and grabbed her by the hair and was like, we're going home. So they're fighting to figure out what happened to their daughter and Robert and Susan have moved on. In February of 1990, Robert decided it was time to sell the South Salem cottage and put that part of his life behind him. Now, believe it or not, this is asked more times than you would think. Selling the cottage does not prevent any further investigation into that home. If investigators ever need access after the home is sold, then they go to the judge, request a search warrant. And instead of it being in the defendant's name, it will actually be in the new homeowner's name. That does not make them any, that doesn't make them reliable. They are not a, you know, an official working part of the story. All they are is asked to be, you know, can you please leave your home so that we can go through and do a search warrant. They're not looking through those people's belongings very much anymore. At that point, they're looking at the structure. But yes, once the home is sold, it doesn't stop investigators from going in. They can still perform a search, and they the only difference is the search warrant will be presented in the new owner's name. However, it doesn't mean they're involved in any other way. By that summer, Robert had went down to Westchester County Courts, and he filed for a divorce against Kathy. He claimed spousal abandonment citing the last time he spoke with his wife was january 31st 1982 some of the recollections of robert he didn't speak to his wife following that evening once she called and said she was at the manhattan apartment he said he didn't hear from her again there's another time when he says he heard from her a couple days later Whatever the truth is, I think this is the truth, honestly, because this is the last date anybody's seen her alive. This is the last opportunity, I believe, that Robert had to really lose control 
and clean up the mess in the process. So I think the story of him hearing from her a couple of days following her disappearance or following him dropping her off at the train station, complete bullshit. This is the truth. And you don't realize you speak the truth when you're supposed to be lying, especially when it comes flying out of your mouth kind of quickly. So in the end, Robert was granted the divorce from Kathy under the provision that she had abandoned their marriage. And he was free to move on. He was no longer tied to Kathy. They were not family. And he was able to move on with Deborah. Now, here's the reason this is important. As long as Kathy is listed as missing, Robert is not free to openly date anyone. He's not free to marry anyone. He's not free to really move on in any form or fashion because he is still legally married to Kathy. So him going down and divorcing her just showed he didn't care what the outcome was. He was done with her and he was moving on and he did it quietly because he knew it would cause a huge shit storm. And it did. It did. I mean, who, what man is hoping that his wife comes back and then Eight years later, goes down and files for a divorce out of spousal abandonment. Mm, if your wife is missing and you're generally concerned with her safety, you're not worried about filing for divorce. Throwing that out there. Now, Deborah and, and Robert have a very strange relationship. The two got along really well. Uh, Deborah came into the relationship with her own money, so there was never a reason for Robert to believe that Deborah was only there for his bank account information. This is important to note because if Robert is a schizophrenic like I, I speculate that he was, then having someone in his life that he didn't feel like was only looking at the numbers in his bank account and really wanted to be with him because of him and his personality, that is very important. Because if there, if he even has an inkling that you're using him for his money, that's a bad idea. Turn, run the other way. If you know information about Kathy and the disappearance, get the out of there because he's going to kill you. Now you're after his money and you, you can take away his freedom. Robert Durst was psychotic. I don't care what anybody says. And Robert had his own money too because from what I can tell, each Durst child was gifted a trust. And they would have access to that trust on a certain birthday. Despite what they choose to do in life. Like Robert, they really thought he was going to go in and, and take over Seymour's position and run the Durst organization. He was the eldest brother. And it, that's kind of how tradition goes. He didn't do that. But he still had access to his trust. It, it didn't matter what they chose to do for a profession. They were still going to have access to this trust fund money. Now, Robert was adamant that he was going to hold on to that money and nobody else was ever going to get it. Um, and he got it. Don't get me wrong. He got it and he spent it like freaking toilet paper being used by a three-year-old. They wrap it around their arm and it's so much. Same concept. Robert's just throwing freaking money everywhere. I wish. Now, here's something that I, I think was a provision in the trust. And it was that if something was to happen and, and the trustee was to be convicted of a crime, serve time in prison, this, that, or the other, the money would revert back into the family's account and it would be divided up amongst those left, basically. So this was another reason that I think Robert was very adamant that he not go down for Kathy's murder because then his trust fund money would revert back to his family. And over his dead body, would he allow that to happen? Robert was a Durst, but he didn't like that he was a Durst, except for the money part of it, of course. He needed to find a way to make sure that that never happened. He needed to protect it from any lawsuits that could come from Kathy's family. 
they would end up filing in 2015 a hundred million dollar wrongful death suit against Robert. But you know, that, I mean, that would have drained him. He probably wouldn't have had very much left after that. It had you know had the outcome been, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But I'm just saying, Robert cared about his money. And it didn't seem like he was caring about Susan too much because they drifted apart during this time. Susan's living with Paul. She's having this family. Robert's dating Deborah. This is a, when I get into Deborah and Robert's relationship a little bit more, it is the weirdest freaking relationship on the planet. In 1992, Paul and Susan would decide to end their five-year relationship and their family. Now, here's the thing, and I love this. Um, it just goes to show how motherly Susan really was. Paul's two children, when they lived with Paul and Susan, she was mom. There was no stepmom, Susan. She was mom. When they split up, Paul's children actually requested to live with Susan in her Brentwood home and they would be granted the right to do so. They, I mean, her stepchildren lived with her after the split with their father. They loved her that much to this day. That is still their mother. And I absolutely love that this family blended together so well that when it didn't work out, there was no, you can't ever see my kids again kind of thing going on. Paul's, like, that's your mom. If you want to go live with her, go live with her. You know, I absolutely love this about that relationship. In the summer of 1999, New York State reopens Kathy's disappearance case. And this changes both Robert and Susan's life. Just as before, Robert turned to Susan, asked her to step up and really be his spokesperson, be the middle person between him and the media. Robert quickly became the focus of the investigation and when it first broke out both of them were blissfully unaware but as soon as Robert got wind shit hit the fan he was freaking out he didn't know what to do and during this investigation Janine Piero was the district attorney and if you don't know who I'm talking about are you really a true crime nerd Really? No? Yeah? You can watch her on TV and she tackles some really great cases and she has some really great opinions. Absolutely love Janine and her point of attacks are hitting the nail on the head every single time. Mm, just love her. Now that they are reopening Kathy's disappearance case, Robert is planning on living the fugitive lifestyle. He's decided, I'm not going to prison. That's not for me. He really, truly, 100% fears it, and he's not going to do it, so he decides he's going to go out on the run. Now, on October 23rd, 2000, we see one of the very first transaction occurring in Robert's bank accounts that lets us know he's going out on the lamb. Now, if you go to the bank and you are fortunate enough to be able to make a withdrawal in the tens of thousands of dollars, then you know there is a form that is filled out and filed so that withdrawal shows up with the IRS. In order to evade filing this paperwork, you would have to take out less than 10 grand. And Robert knew that. So he began taking out money in the sums of $9,000 to $9,500 at a time. More than enough to live on in a month. But sometimes these withdrawal transactions would be once a week. Robert would do this 48 times from October 23rd, 2000 to September 28, 2001. This is the time he is going to be on the run, be on the lamb, whatever you want to call it. I don't know. On October 31st, something that could really increase his risk of, of being charged with Kathy's murder and going to prison occurred and it was the New York press leaked. It was working on an article about Kathy's disappearance and about her case being reopened. Robert said that once he heard about the article, he quote, I went into the bathroom and threw up, end quote. 
Robert may have been known locally and may have been convicted in the in society's eyes over Kathy's disappearance from that area. But with the New York press picking this up and doing a story, it would only be a matter of time before the entire nation convicted him before he could actually go to trial. And they would be calling for the state of New York to do something. They want they would want him arrested. And he knew that. He knew this was not going to play in his favor. So time to go forward with our plan. On November 3rd of 2000, Robert quietly went down and he filed for a marriage license for him and for Deborah. On November 7th, Robert met with criminal defense attorney Joel Cohen to see what this whole thing could amount to if, for some reason, Robert was charged. If he ended up being charged in connection with Kathy's disappearance, his bail could exceed $1 million, if given bail at all. Since he had an afforded lifestyle, it was questioned whether or not he would be a flight risk, considering that uh, he had access to money, he had access to plane tickets, planes. If Robert wanted to get on a plane with a million dollars, he could do so in less than 24 hours. That's a flight risk. And so there's a good chance they may not even offer him bail. Well, this terrified Robert. He didn't want to go to jail. And he sure as hell didn't want to be denied bond. So going forward with the plan yet again. Robert and Deborah would wed in a very unexcited manner. They hired a private rabbi to marry them. Deborah was Jewish on November 11th of 2000. Like I said, it was boring. I don't, I don't even, I know there has to be a witness, so there's probably one person, but other than that, it was just Robert, Deborah, the rabbi, and their witness. That's it. Uh, they didn't make a big deal out of it. They didn't dress up. There wasn't any photographs. There wasn't a party or a dinner or whatever afterwards. They were married. Now they could go on their separate ways. Why did they get married? The two were taking advantage of spousal communications privilege and spousal testimonial privileges that prevented spouses from having to condemn their spouse or be condemned by their spouse. Basically, whatever it was that Deborah knew about Kathy's disappearance or anything else, Robert marrying her would protect her and protect him and neither one would be forced to testify against the other. And if for some reason Robert was arrested for murder and sentenced to prison, well, that money would now revert to his wife instead of his family. She had money. She was dating a guy with money. Robert's money was secure. If he needed it, Deborah went down and sent it to him. From what I can see, he protected only the things he cared about the most. As you can see, Susan was not one of those people. November 11th would also be the Saturday that the New York Daily News and the New York Times published front page articles covering the reopening of Kathy's case. It talked of divers searching Truesdale Lake in the shoreline that bordered the defendant's former cottage in South Salem. It talked about investigators removing a piece of the master bedroom wall and taking some mud from the lake. Investigators were in contact with a prosecutor who was successful in convicting a plastic surgeon who had murdered his wife, yet her body had not been found and couldn't prove that she was actually murdered. But he was successful successful in convicting the surgeon so investigators wanted to talk to him and kind of see what his plan of attack was and could they use it in this case that they were working on now dogs were also brought out to search the south salem property but they were unsuccessful in their efforts and investigators were digging into all of the accusations coming from kathy's family now Robert viewed this as guilty, signed, sealed, delivered. 
quote, people were going to find me guilty. I'd been guilty for years in the newspaper, end quote. It's time to get the hell out of there. So on November 13th of 2000, just two days after his wedding, he put his plan into action and went, he fleed and went to find somewhere to hide. And quote, seemed like about as good a place to hide as there was in the world, end quote. And this is Robert landing on the decision to hide out in Galveston, Texas. Robert got to his apartment that he kept in Dallas. From there, he drove to Galveston. Once inside the city limits, the name Robert Durst was forgotten, and he never spoke that name when meeting someone new. Robert said, quote, I intended never to use the name Robert Durst again, end quote. On November 14, 2000, Robert disguised himself with a woman's wig, baggy clothing, and a sign that said, I am mute. He headed out into Galveston's day, bright, beautiful. He was going to go find him a place to live. On the second open house of an apartment, he signed a lease with Claus Dillman. Only this lease was signed by Dorothy Siner. It was a tiny bare minimum apartment. A far cry from what you would think a multimillionaire would want to live in. On November 16th, Robert knew that he couldn't use his vehicle, his driver's license, or his credit cards. None of that because it would all come back to Robert Durst and he didn't want to be Robert anymore. So he hopped in his car. He drove out to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, parked it, and left it. He then got on a Greyhound bus from Baton Rouge to Houston, and then from Houston to Galveston. And Robert managed to not touch anything, sell, license, credit cards, until the middle of September of 2001. At some point, Robert and Susan were talking they talked on the phone frequently. This was how they stayed in communication with one another. And Susan tells Robert that the LAPD had contacted her and were wanting to speak to her about what she knew. And Susan suggested that she talk to them saying, quote, it's going to be best for both of us if I just talk to them, end quote. Now, the date of that conversation when she told Robert that she felt like she needed to speak with LAPD, I don't know the exact date. But we do know from the introduction that she had a friend that she told she knew some information. And once it came out, it would completely blow the lid off of things. That occurred December 19th. And just days before her murder. But I don't know if... She was going to tell LAPD what she knew or if she had fabricated another story in order to help Robert in succeeding and getting away yet again. I don't know. It was never discussed. Um, it was never written down by Susan. She didn't tell anybody. And I'm not really sure that she told Robert what she wanted to talk to them about. Whatever the case may be, it didn't matter because the moment she suggested going and talking to the police was the moment she sealed her fate with Robert and he was going to kill her. When reopening Kathy's case became a public knowledge, Susan turned to Robert around that same time asking for some help financially. This is the biggest no-no if you're going to be friends with Robert Durst. He never wanted anyone in his life that only liked him for the money he had. So the moment you ask for money, suggest a way to spend his money or what have you. Robert decided to cut you out of his life at that same moment. Now, here's the kicker. If you knew anything about Kathy, well, that meant she had to die. You weren't just cut out of his life. He was going to kill you. But if you just knew him in passing and knew nothing about his wife and you asked to borrow money, you know, you're done with Robert Durst. You'll never be friends with him again. Susan and Robert have been best friends for a very long time. So he went ahead and sent her a check for $25,000. Then in the beginning of December, 
he sent her another check for $25,000, totaling $50,000. Many say this is what she asked Robert to borrow. I don't know that's true. There's nothing in writing, nothing like that. I do know that $50,000 was sent to Susan. And at the time, Susan was living in an apartment. And I don't know if she was struggling really honestly financially or if there was just some things she needed to get taken care of and it was just easier for her to ask Robert for the money. I don't know. On December 19th of 2000, Robert flew from New York City to Wairika, California. And the last leg went from San Francisco to Wairika and Robert switched to a commuter plane in San Francisco for that last leg of the journey. Once he was when once he was in Rarica, Robert went over to the Ford dealership, picked up a Ford Explorer. He would use this vehicle to drive him to and from the murder scene. On December 20th of 2000, Robert cashed a $9,500 check inside of a bank in Wairica before driving south on the 101 into Los Angeles. Just an hour outside of Wairica, Robert decided he needed to take care of some phone calls, but instead of using his cell phone because he knew it would ping him in the area and if they looked at him after discovering that she was murdered, it would probably give them probable cause to charge him with a murder. So he didn't use his cell phone, smart man, in this area. Instead, he went and used a payphone. Great idea. Except for the calls he made from that payphone were collect. He is the only millionaire that called anybody collect because he said, I need to talk to them and they need to know this so it needs to be on their dime, not my dime. That's the way he looked at that. Crazy. Not only that, but he would later confirm that he made those phone calls. Robert later admitted to a close family friend, Emily Altman, he was in L.A. staying at a hotel in Beverly Hills close to Susan's home during the time when she was murdered. On December 22nd, Susan returned home around 1030 that evening after being out at a movie with her friend Richard Markey. At some time during the late hours of the 22nd or the early hours of the 23rd, Robert entered into Susan's home. They believe that Robert may have knocked on the door and Susan invited him in because there were no signs of forced entry. Robert then pulled out his 9mm handgun, placed it to the back of Susan's head, and pulled the trigger. He didn't even try to stage a break-in or a robbery or anything. There was no ransacking of the home in any way. On December 23rd, the infamous cadaver note was mailed to Beverly Hills Police Department. The envelope had block-style lettering, and the name Beverly was misspelled as B-E-V-E-R-L-E-Y instead of B-E-V-E-R-L-Y. The paper inside of the envelope simply said cadaver and gave Susan's address. Robert then drove the Explorer back to Northern California, bought a one-way ticket to New York at the counter inside of San Francisco International Airport, and departed on a 10.30 p.m. red eye. Now let's go back a little bit and let me introduce you to Morris Julius Black. He was born October 21st, 1929 to Franny and Samuel Black. Little is known about Morris prior to meeting Robert Durst in Galveston. We do know that he was arrested sometime during 1997 for threatening to blow up a local utility company when he claims that they overcharged him $50. On November 15, 2000, Morris met with Robert. This was the second day after Robert had moved in. Morris went over to complain about a meter. Morris was highly known for his negative attitude and his very strong, thick Boston accent. The two became very fast best friends very quickly, and within a few weeks of meeting, Robert told Morris he was the mute woman, but he wasn't mute. So he admits that he is on the lam, and Robert told Morris, quote, I wanted to disappear and and hide and Morris shot back with 
Yeah, I did that a long time ago. And as the two grew closer, Robert started noticing Morris began using him slowly, but more and more for his money. In reality, once he figured out that Robert had money, Morris was milking him very slowly. Robert claims that if the two went out to a bar, Robert paid. If the two went out to a restaurant, Robert paid. Like with Susan, Robert was feeling used for his money. In March of 2001, Robert decided that he needed a plan B just in case this Galveston thing didn't work out like he had hoped. Well, we have Kathy who's missing and now we have Susan who's been murdered. Things are starting to trickle back to him. So having a backup plan, probably not the worst idea. Robert contacts Michael Ogden in New Orleans and he pretends to be an assistant to a deaf to a mute woman who is currently looking for a place to live when Robert meets up with Ogden like they had scheduled on the phone to look at the apartment Robert is dressed up as yet another mute woman Diane Wynn signed a lease with Ogden good from October April 1st, 2001 to March 30th of 2002. On July 13th, 2001, Morris received an eviction notice and he took it over to Robert and he showed him and he asked him, you know, could you help cover this past rent so I'm not kicked out of my home? This, that, and the other. Now, I don't know if Robert actually did end up paying for Morris's Mac back rent i'm not really for sure what robert likes to talk about following this is how the two would go around galveston looking at open homes robert would make comments while they were looking around saying well this place is big enough and if you buy it i could move in too and you wouldn't even really know that i'm here so again robert feels like he is being pushed into a direction of buying something he really doesn't want to and in all honesty Purchasing a home with an alias, probably not going to be the easiest thing. He would need to use the name Robert Durst in order to obtain a mortgage or buy it outright, whatever. And this was a no-no for Robert. He got, he came to Galveston to get away. And it felt like Morris was pushing him to the light more and more every day. On July 25th of 2001, ABC ran an episode called Vanish, the Cold Case of Kathy Durst. Robert knew this episode was coming out, and he made sure that he was home, sitting down, ready to watch it when it premiered. It was during that program that Robert realized that he had let his guard down while in Galveston and told Morris all about Kathy and possibly about what happened with Susan all of which only needed one phone call to come to investigators and Robert could go down. So it was time for Morris to go. On August 30th, Robert went out and purchased a 22 pistol, the same caliber gun that was used to kill Morris. Possibly that was the weapon, but... I don't think there was ever any confirmation and and I'll tell you why here in just a minute. Robert also purchased hollow point bullets. He said, quote, from being around guns that hollow point bullets, they expand faster and therefore would do more damage than a slug would, end quote. On September 12th, Robert purchased two money orders for his landlord Dillman an eight, for $800 and this would cover Robert's rent through the end of November. On September 19th, Robert packed up the majority of his apartment preparing to leave for town. This explains why when investigators went into his apartment after the murder of Morris Black, there was virtually nothing in it. Nothing. Very little anything. On September 22nd, Robert hired a cleaning lady using an alias to come and clean the apartment before he left Galveston. So on September 23rd, Robert took himself into the luxury hotel San Luis in Galveston. 
and he was going to spend time away from the apartment building, separating himself from Morris and from the crime scene. On September 28th of 2001, this is how Robert remembers the murder going down. Quote, there's a yellow thing on a sweater or whatever, jacket on top of the table, and I'm, you know, primed, saying, Morris, get out of here, period, I'm leaving, get out, I don't ever want to see you again. He then takes the gun out from under whatever the yellow thing is on the on the table, I grabbed him and the gun, we fell down in the kitchen, the gun goes off and shoots him in the side of the face. Robert adamantly claims that Morris's death was in self-defense and a total accident. What really went down, we will never know, but I assume it's going to be fairly similar to the way Susan was killed. And I suspect this is also the way that Kathy was killed. Robert invited Morris over to the apartment. Once he was over and Robert was able to get behind him, he raised the pistol and shot him in the back of the head. Then he dismembered the body, knowing that he was not strong enough to remove Morris as one piece. Where Robert failed was he put these pieces in trash bags and then he tied them up, sealing them and locking air into the bags and it's just enough that the bags never sank they all floated so when robert dumped morris's body parts in galveston bay on september 29th they stayed on top of the water robert then drove out of town and went to go live in his new apartment in new orleans on september 30th a little boy who was fishing in galveston bay discovered the floating trash bags with morris's body parts However, his head was never recovered. On October 8th of 2001, Robert decided that he was going to go back to Galveston and pick up a set of prescription glasses. Same thing I think that occurred prior to Morris's death. And therefore, when it came up that they were ready, he felt like he needed to go and pick them up instead of trying to purchase a new prescription somewhere in New Orleans. So on October 8th, he drove back into Galveston. On October 9th, Robert went into the eyeglass clinic, picked up his eyeglasses, and left. At this point, investigators had landed on the mute lady turned Mel, who was disguising himself that was considered Morris's neighbor. And as investigators began digging into this mute woman, Robert's whole shebang unraveled. So while he was in town picking up his prescription, investigators knew he was coming back. And he they'd already got to the eyeglass clinic and said, you know, when he comes in, call us. So as Robert pulls out of the parking lot, Investigators are right there, thanks to the staff members sticking to their agreement, and Robert was arrested for the murder of Morris Black. Inside of his vehicle, they recovered a 9mm handgun, not the caliber used to kill Morris, but it did match the caliber for the gun that killed Susan Berman in California just a year before. Robert was charged and bond was set at $250,000. And when the detective told him, you know, your bond is this amount of money, Robert looks at him and says, well, what do I do? And the investigator says, well, unless you have $250,000 on you, you're kind of here to stay. And Robert gives him the blankest stare before he says, well, I don't have it on me. Like, he was asking, do you have five bucks? You know, I don't have five bucks. It's not on me, but, you know, give me a minute. Robert was treating $250,000 in that same manner. Robert would use his phone call to call Deborah, let her know that he had been arrested. Um, and he needed her to access his accounts and send him $250,000 cash Deborah's living back in New York with her longtime live-in boyfriend. And even though she's married to Robert, could you say she's a bigamist? Not really. 
I mean, legally, she never went and married this other man. She just lived with him like they were roommates for a while. Once Robert bonds out of jail, he immediately goes out on the lamb. This time, disguising himself by shaving his head and eyebrows. Robert had taken two more people from this world, all because of what they knew about what happened on the night of January 31st, 1982. And with that information, they were capable of putting him behind bars, possibly for the rest of his life. Not to mention inside of Robert, he felt like both of them only had something to do with him because of his money, seeing how both of them asked him for some money prior to their deaths. Robert feared only being liked or put up with was because of his bank account. And if he was a schizophrenic like I suspect he was, this would only be intensified by auditory and visual hallucinations, voices telling him they only like you for your money on repeat day in and day out. This is not to say that borrowing or expecting money from Robert was the worst that they could do, but combing Combining those things equaled murder in Robert's eyes. Susan stuck by Robert up until her death. Her children believed that there was no conceivable way that he would kill their mother until it was proven he was the person to take her away from them. Join me next week as we go into the murder trials for both Susan Berman and Morris Black, both with completely different outcomes, Robert Durst, the serial killer, was coming to the surface, and the media and nerds were enchanted by the whole thing. As always, I leave you with one last line. You never really know the true quality of someone's character until the road gets rocky. Much love, the true crime librarian.